Welcome to Worlds of Speculative Fiction, Session 72. We are going back to an author who we looked at before with a trilogy of his works, J.G. Ballard, and now we're looking at an earlier and more thematically connected trilogy of some of his very earliest novels, the world series we could call them, each of which represents a way in which the universe as we know it, the world that we live in, starts to go wrong for human beings, although not necessarily for everything else. So we're going to be talking about The Drowned World, uh, which came out in 1962, uh, a book that now is translated as The Drought, but originally was called The Burning World. It might have been changed in part because there's another important uh, novel out there called The Burning World that came out in 64. And then this very interesting The Crystal World that came out in 66. And each of these represents, as I mentioned, a way in which things go awry in an ecological, global scale. And in some respect, they can be a little bit prescient, scarily prescient for ways that we'll, we'll discuss later. Now, we're going to be talking about world building and the depiction of the world that we actually live in. And we'll look at some things that Ballard himself had to say about these particular novels, the sequence, the individual books. We'll look at what goes on in them and some really important philosophical themes. Now, if this is your first time to Worlds of Speculative Fiction, uh, let me welcome you, but let me also tell you a little bit about what this is and what's going on. So this is a series, you know, when I said that this is episode 72, we have done 72 different sessions within the series. And it began way back in 2016 when we had session one at the Brookfield Public Library. Uh, back then, this was an in-person event, which we recorded and then put onto my YouTube channel. And many people commented and, and watched the videos and had things to say about them. And in each session, beyond the first, which was you know spent talking about what's the nature of fantasy, science fiction, speculative fiction, world building, we would take an author and a coherent world that spanned multiple works and we'd explore that world and we'd talk about the biography of the author as well and how that influenced it and maybe go into some reviews and talk about their own influence on other people and then we'd go into the philosophical themes that were involved in or sometimes even explicitly talked about within the novels or short stories whatever it is that we were Looking at, we started with Tolkien, and we spanned everything going up to uh, contemporary authors and uh, all sorts of people in between. So, at a certain point during the COVID crisis, we had to stop doing the in-person sessions, and we began doing it in the format that you see now, where what'll go on is I'll talk for about ninety minutes or so. Um, about different aspects of this. It's one big long video. We typically premiere it and we do some live chat on the side. People can ask questions, make comments, uh, and then I respond to them. And then after that, we'll have the more interactive, uh, not quite face to face, but at least partly getting to see each other's faces through a Zoom session. And that's the way that we've been doing these, oh, for, you know, uh, about three years at this point. So uh, we got a lot to talk about with these really great, short, uh, eminently readable novels, so reflective of the worldview of Ballard himself. And we're going to talk about, you know, the different paths that humanity and the planet that we live on might be taking. Uh, so We'll start first by doing a little bit of summary of the novels, talking about what is happening to the world in each of them and why it's 
you know, kind of scary stuff, but presented in a very matter of fact way by J.G. Ballard. I think that with each of these three world novels, Drowned World, Burning World, Slash, The Drought, and Crystal World, we can in fact talk about world building, but it's in a somewhat different sense than what we are used to with, say, sci-fi or fantasy novels, where there is an alternate world. I mean, it is, in some respects, an alternate world to our own. In each of these, there's some sort of massive ecological disaster that affects not just humanity, not just the flora and fauna, but the entirety of the planet, and we could even say the solar system. So before we look at characters, the theme of inner space and psychology, we should actually look at the geography and the changing climate of each of these. And when we begin with the drowned world, we learn from the very sentence, soon it would be too hot. Now, that is quite a statement, rather ambiguous. Too hot, per se? Too hot for humanity on this planet at all? Or just too hot in massive zones of the planet? When we get introduced to the main character, Karens, looking out from the hotel balcony shortly after eight o'clock karen's watched the sun rise behind the dense groves of giant gymnosperms crowding over the roofs of the abandoned department stores 400 yards away on the east side of the lagoon and in that sentence we have four elements that play just a massive role we have the sun rising. We'll talk about why the sun is so important in just a bit. Dense groves of giant gymnosperms, ancient trees, uh, ancient uh, plants that are, that are growing now in crazy ways. Uh, an abandoned department store 400 yards away and the east side of the lagoon, the water that has been continually rising. And uh, we go on, even through the mass of olive green fronds, the relentless power of the sun was plainly tangible. The blunt refracted rays drummed against his bare chest and shoulders, drawing out the first sweat, and he put on a pair of heavy sunglasses to protect his eyes. The solar disk was no longer a well-defined sphere, but a wide expanding ellipse that fanned out across the eastern horizon like a colossal fireball, its reflection turning the dead leaden surface of the lagoon into a brilliant copper shield by noon less than four hours away the water would seem to burn so that's our first description of this world and we find out that um, something is going to be happening Soon Riggs and Karens are talking to each other and they're talking about the, the radio console and Riggs says, do you ever listen to that thing? And Karen says, no, that never there's any point. We know the news for the next three million years. And uh, Riggs says, oh, you should turn it on now and then. You'll hear all sorts of interesting things. For example, uh, this morning you would have heard that exactly three days from now we're packing up and leaving for good. Apparently the water level is still rising. All the work we've done has been a total waste. As I've always maintained, incidentally, the American and Russian units are being recalled as well. Temperatures in the equator are up to 180 degrees now, going up steadily, and the rain belts are continuous as high as the 20th parallel. There is more silt too. So this is describing the ongoing succession of what's happening. We get another interesting um, depiction here a little bit further in. Um, 
The bulk of the city had long since vanished and only the steel supported buildings of the central commercial and financial areas had survived the encroaching floodwaters. The brick houses and single story factories of the suburbs had disappeared completely between the drifting tides of silt, where these broke surface giant forests reared up into the burning dull green sky, smothering the former wheat fields of temperate Europe and North America, impenetrable Mato Grosso, sometimes 300 feet high. They were a nightmare world of competing organic forms returning rapidly to their Paleozoic past. And the only avenues of transit for the United Nations military units were through the lagoon systems that had superimposed themselves on the former cities. But even these were now being clogged with silt and then submerged. And so Karen could remember the unending succession of green twilights that settled behind them as he and Riggs moved slowly northward across Europe, leaving one city after another. Now they were to abandon yet another city. Despite the massive construction of the main commercial buildings, it consisted of little more than three principal lagoons surrounded by a nexus of small lakes 50 yards in diameter and a network of narrow creeks and inlets which wound off roughly following the original street plan of the city out into the outlying jungle. So we've got a massively transformed urbanized landscape that has now been largely reclaimed. And uh, we, we learn what has caused this uh, again, very early on, here's how it's described. The succession of gigantic geophysical upheavals which had transformed the Earth's climate had made their first impact some 60 or 70 years earlier. A series of violent and prolonged solar storms lasting several years caused by a sudden instability in the sun had enlarged the Van Allen belts and diminished the Earth's gravitational hold upon the outer layers of the ionosphere. As these vanished into space, depleting the Earth's barrier against the full impact of solar radiation, temperatures began to climb steadily. The heated atmosphere expanding outward into the ionosphere where the cycle was completed. All over the world, mean temperatures rose by a few degrees each year. The majority of tropical areas rapidly became uninhabitable, entire populations migrating north or south from temperatures of 130 and 140 degrees. Overtempered areas became tropical. Europe and North America sweltering under continuous heat waves, temperatures rarely falling below 100 degrees. Under the direction of the United Nations, colonization began of the Antarctic Plateau and of the northern borders of the Canadian and Russian continents. And he goes on and tells us, over this initial period of 20 years, a gradual adjustment of life took place to meet the altered climate. A slackening of the previous tempo was inevitable and there was little spare energy available to cut back the encroaching jungles of the equatorial region. Not only was the growth of all plant forms accelerated, but the higher levels of radioactivity increased the rate at which mutations occurred. The first freak botanical forms appeared, recalling the giant tree firms of the carbon, Carboniferous period, and there was a drastic upsurge of all lower plant and animal forms. So we've got now the sun, the ionosphere, the heat, and now we've got changing of the flora. But it goes on. The arrival of these distant forebears was overlaid by the second major geophysical upheaval. The continued heating of the atmosphere had begun to melt the polar ice caps. The entrained ice seas of the Antarctic Plateau broke and dissolved tens of thousands of glaciers around the Arctic Circle from Greenland and Northern Europe, Russia and North America poured themselves into the sea. Millions of acres of permafrost liquefied into gigantic rivers. So it's not just the ice caps, the permafrost in the north as well. Here again, the rise of global water levels would have been little more than a few feet, 
but the huge discharging channels carried with them billions of tons of topsoil. Massive deltas formed at their mouths, extending the continental coastlines, damming up the oceans. The, their effective spread sh th shrank from two-thirds of the world's area to only slightly more than half. Driving the submerged silt before them, the new seas completely altered the shape and contours of the continents. The Mediterranean contracted into a system of inland lakes. The British Isles was linked again with northern France. The Middle West of the United States, filled by the Mississippi as it drained the Rocky Mountains, became an enormous gulf opening into the Hudson Bay, while the Caribbean Sea was transformed into a desert of silt and salt flats. Europe became a system of giant lagoons centered on the principal low-lying cities, inundated by the silt carried southward by the expanding rivers. So what an imaginative vista for the world, I won't even say the new world, the altered world, the going back to previous conditions world that humanity now has to survive within moving northward, moving southward. He goes on and says, during the next 30 years, the poleward migration of populations continued. A few fortified cities defied the rising water levels and encroaching jungles, building elaborate seawalls around their perimeters. But one by one, these were breached. Only within the former Arctic and Antarctic circles was life tolerable. The oblique incidence of the sun's rays provided a shield against the more powerful radiation. Cities on higher ground and mountainous areas near the equator had been abandoned despite their cooler temperatures because of the diminished atmospheric protection. So the only consolation to this, as he's going to tell us in the next paragraph, is the decline in mammalian fertility. Very few children are being born and the earth can no longer sustain much human life. Uh, just in order not to take up too much time, I'll only bring up uh, one other uh, short uh, piece here. So this is one more description early on in the work. Like an immense putrescent sore, the jungle lay exposed be below the open hatchway of the helicopter. Giant groves of gymnosperm stretched in dense clumps among the rooftops of the submerged buildings, smothering the white rectangular outlines. Here and there, an old concrete water tower protruded from the morass, or the remains of a makeshift jetty still floated along the husk of a collapsing office block overgrown with feathery acacias and flowering tamarisks. We could go on and on with this, but we don't, I don't think we need to. I think you've got the picture of what the drowned world looks like. Very few places remaining for human beings, and now they're supposed to press on northward. The burning world, or the drought, as it comes to be known later on with slightly different chapter arrangements, situates us in a world where, as you can guess, water becomes the main resource that is further and further lacking. And in this case, it is because of human interventions in the environment, as we'll talk about. And all the action takes place near the coastal areas and so we get this interesting description happening early on shielding his eyes from the sunlight ransom surveyed the silent banks of the river as they wound westward to the city of mount royal five miles away for a week he'd been out on the lake sailing the houseboat among the draining creeks and mud flats as he waited for the evacuation of the city to end after the closure of the hospital on mount royal he intended to leave for the coast but at the last minute decided to spend a few final days on the lake before it vanished for good. Now and then, between the humps of damp mud emerging from the center of the lake, he'd seen the instant span of the motor bridge across the river, the windows of thousands of cars and trucks flashing like jeweled lances as they set off on the coast road for the south. But for the most part, he had been alone, suspended like the houseboat above the dissolving glass of the water. Time had seemed becalmed. 
Uh, and then by then the lake, once a stretch of open water 30 miles in length had subsided into a series of small pools and channels separated by the banks of draining mud. So what we see here, the, what he calls the slow transformation of the lake, wide sheets of water contracted first into shallow lagoons and then into maze of creeks, the wet dunes of the lake bed seem to emerge from another dimension, right? There are slopes of mud. He's steering the houseboat to the entrance of the river along stranded yachts and fishing boats. And everything has been essentially abandoned. Now, what caused this? We actually get an explanation here. Uh, in part one, the worldwide drought now in its fifth month was the culmination of a series of extended droughts that had taken place with increasing frequency all over the globe during the previous decade. Ten years earlier, a critical shortage of world foodstuffs had occurred when the seasonal rainfall expected in a number of important agricultural areas had failed to materialize. One by one, areas as far apart as Saskatchewan and the Loire Valley, Kazakhstan and the Madras Tea Country were turned into arid dust basins. The following months brought little more than a few inches of rain and after two years, these farmlands were totally devastated. Once their populations had resettled themselves elsewhere, these new deserts were abandoned for good. The continued appearance of more and more such areas on the map and the added difficulties of making good the world's food supplies led to the first attempts at some form of global weather control. A survey by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization showed that everywhere river levels and water tables were falling. The two and a half million square miles drained by the Amazon had shrunk to less than half this area. Scores of its tributaries had dried up completely and aerial surveys discovered that much of the former rainforest was already dry and petrified. At Khartoum in Lower Egypt, the White Nile was 20 feet below its mean level 10 years earlier and lower outlets were bored in the concrete barrage of the dam at Aswan. Despite worldwide attempts at cloud seeding, the amounts of rainfall continued to diminish. The seeding operations finally ended when it was obvious that not only was there no rain, but there were no clouds. At this point, attention switched to the ultimate source of rainfall, the ocean surface. It needed only the briefest scientific examination to show that here were the origins of the drought. So we have this cataclysmic drought and reduction of water tables worldwide resulting in massive population dislocations and a major disruption of the food systems throughout the world. What's causing this? Well, he goes on to tell us, covering the offshore waters of the world's oceans to a distance of about a thousand miles from the coast was a thin but resilient monomolecular film formed from a complex of saturated long chain polymers generated within the sea from the vast quantities of industrial wastes discharged into the ocean basins during the previous 50 years. This tough oxygen permeable membrane lay on the water, air, air water interface and prevented almost all evaporation of surface water into the airspace above. Although the structure of these polymers was quickly identified, no means was found of removing them. The saturated linkages produced in the perfect organic bath of the sea were completely non-reactive and formed an intact seal broken only when the water was violently disturbed. Fleets of trawlers and naval craft equipped with rotating flails began to ply up and down the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of North America and along the seaboards of Western Europe, but without any long-term effects. The removal of the entire surface water provided only a temporary respite. The film quickly replaced itself by lateral extension from the surrounding surface recharged by precipitation from the reservoir below. The mechanism of formation of these polymers remained obscure, but millions of tons of highly reactive industrial waste, unwanted petroleum fractions, contaminated catalysts and solvents were still being vented into the sea where they mingled with the waste of atomic power stations and sewage schemes. Out of this brew, the sea had constructed a skin no thicker than a few atoms, but sufficiently strong to devastate the lands it once irrigated. So this is the causality, and it turns out 
there's not a lot that human beings can actually do about this except suffer the effects. And he goes on to call it this act of retribution by the sea and said it had always impressed ransom by its simple justice, right? So, you know, there's, there's uh, nothing going on. There are cumulus clouds burdened like Madonna's with cool rain, which still formed over the central ocean surfaces, but they would always deposit their cargo into the dry, unsaturated air above the sealed offshore waters, never onto the crying land. And the land becomes more and more and more dry. The water places are eventually going away. Later on, they talk about following the residue of a river as it winds across a lake. The channel narrowed sometimes to little no more than 15 feet in width, at others dividing into thin streams that disappeared among the dunes and mud banks. Stranded yachts lay on the slopes streaked with the scum lines of the receding water. The bed of the lake, almost drained, was now an inland beach of white dunes covered with pieces of blanched timber and driftwood. Along the bank, the dried marsh grass firm formed a burnt palisade. That is the landscape, well, formerly the lakescape that they have. Now, there is something interesting that we find out later on, um, and it has to do with waves. And they're talking about perhaps there will be a tidal wave Tonight, once every three or four years in response to some distant submarine earthquake, a huge wave would inundate the coast. The third and last of these some two years earlier had swept across the salt flats an hour before dawn, reaching to the very margins of the beach. The hundreds of shacks and dwellings among the dunes had been destroyed by the waist-high water. The reservoir pools, where they keep the water for themselves, uh, washed away in a few seconds, staggering about in the sliding salt. They'd watched everything they owned carried away. As the luminous water swilled around the wrecked ships, the exhausted beach dwellers had climbed up to the salt tips and sat there until dawn. Then in the first light, they'd seen a fabulous spectacle. The entire stretch of the draining salt flats was covered with the expiring forms of thousands, tens of thousands of stranded fish, every pool alive with crabs and shrimps. The ensuing blood feast as the gulls dived and screamed around the flashing spears had rekindled the remaining survivors. For three weeks, they moved from pool to pool and gorged themselves like beasts performing an obscene Eucharist. Right? So they're, they're living fairly close to nature, you might say. Um, in part three, we find that uh, Ransom wants to follow along this river uh, dried up now. The flat deck of the river stretched away to the north at its margins where the remains of the stone embankment formed a ragged windbreak. The dunes had gathered together in high drifts and these defined the wind winding course of the drained bed. Beyond the dunes is the desert floor, littered with fragments of dried mud like shards of pottery. At intervals, the stump of a tree marked the distance of a concealed ridge from the river or a metal windmill uh, stood guard over a dried up creek. In the coastal hills, the upper slopes of the valley had flowered with a few clumps of hardy gorse sustained by the drifts of spray. But 10 miles from the sea, the desert was arid, the surface crumbling beneath the foot into a fine white powder. The party moved at a steady pace along the drained bed. And why are they doing this? Because Ransom is convinced that there must be water within 30 or 20 miles of the coast, probably released from a spring or an underground river. Why? Because there's a lion prowling around in the desert. And so they're on this perhaps quixotic uh, adventure of going further inland to try to find this water source. And this is an interesting uh, novel of these three because as opposed to the drowned world where uh, things aren't going to get better and humanity has receded to the, to the polar regions and as opposed to the crystal world, which we're going to look at in just a moment where, again, prospects are not good, this one ends on a slightly different note. So this is the last few paragraphs. 
Although it was not yet noon, the sun seemed to be receding into the sky and the air was becoming colder. To his surprise, he noticed he no longer cast any shadow on the sand. As if he had at last completed his journey across the margins of the inner landscape he'd carried in his mind for so long, the light failed and the air grew darker. The dust was dull and opaque, the crystals in its surface dead and clouded. An immense pall of darkness lay over the dunes, as if the whole of the exterior world were losing its existence. It was some time later that he failed to notice it had started to rain. So there is a possibility of the earth returning to something like what we call normalcy, you know, a weather pattern where clouds actually form and blot out the sun and then rain upon the land. Is it hopeful? It's difficult to tell because we don't have enough information as the work ends. But this is somewhat different than the other two world books that we're looking at here. The third novel, The Crystal World, doesn't begin as the other two do with us already in the middle of crisis. Rather, it begins with an enigma, something unexplained, some questions that are being raised as this doctor is trying to make his way into Cameroon. And we begin with a letter that he's received. This is Dr. Sanders uh, from Suzanne. And she tells him, at last we are here. The forest is the most beautiful in Africa, a house of jewels. I can barely find words to describe our wonder each morning as we look out across the slope, still half hidden by the mist, but glistening like St. Sophia, each bow a jeweled semi-dome. Indeed, Max says I'm becoming excessively Byzantine. I wear my hair to my waist, even at the clinic, and affect a melancholy expression, right? And it concludes by saying, they walk through the dark forest with crowns of light on their head. It sounds very metaphorical, right? Oh, you know, it's a beautiful dawn with, you know, beads of water condensed on the foliage, and it's like jewels. But as we're going to find out, it's not really the case. Now, he, Sanders is trying to get to Mount, Mount Royal, and the clerk at the reception desk is evasive, right? He says that, um, doctor, you understand there is no boat. The service has been suspended. And then uh, Sanders says, okay, uh, what about the railway or the bus service? There must be some transport to Mount Royal. And the clerk says, there's no railway. Diamonds, you know, doctor, not difficult to transport. Maybe you can make inquiries about the bus. And he's finding it more and more difficult to get to Mount Royal. Eventually, he's talking to um, the African charge captain, and he says, you know, why the censorship going on here? Why blocking things off? I find there's no means of getting to Mount Royal, and an atmosphere of mystery surrounds the whole place. The captain po nodded, pondering over the letter on his desk. Occasionally, he prodded the tissue with a steel ruler, as though he were examining the pressed petals of some rare and perhaps poisonous blossom. I understand, doctor. It's difficult for you. And Sanders says, but why is the censorship in force at all? Has a rebel group captured the mines? The captain shook his head. I assure you, doctor, there's no political trouble at Mount Royal. In fact, there's hardly anyone there at all. It, most of the workers have left. The captain stood up and went over to the window. He pointed to the dark fringe of the jungle crowding over the rooftops of the native quarter. The forest doctor, do you see? It frightens them. It's so black and heavy all the time. In confidence, I can explain there is a new kind of plant disease beginning in the forest near Mount Royal. What do you mean, Sanders cut in, a virus disease like to tobacco mosaic? Yes, that's it, the captain nodded encouragingly, though he seemed to have little idea of what he was talking about. 
Anyway, it's not poisonous, but we have to take precautions. Some experts will look at the forest, send samples to Libreville. You understand it takes time. And then uh, Sanders says, well, I'd be able to go to Mount Royal. The army hasn't closed off the area. No, the captain insisted. You are quite free. Just small areas, you see. It's not dangerous. Your friends are all right. We don't want people rushing there trying to make trouble. And then he says, well, how long has this been going on? And the captain says, about a year, longer perhaps. At first, no one bothered. So what's actually going on? Well, there's some hints when people are bringing, you know, these uh, jewel-encrusted, crystallized pieces of fungus and flora and even crosses into the marketplace. But a little bit later, we find that... Um, Sanders is having a conversation with uh, Raddick, and Raddick says, um, it seems that the business here and your own specialty are very similar. And in a way, one is the dark side of the other. I'm thinking of the silver scales of leprosy that give the disease its name. Now, tell me, have you seen any of the crystallized objects? Some flowers and leaves. Sanders decided not to mention the dead man that morning who had been found crystallized. So um, Raddick says, this has been going on for some time, nearly a year. In fact, first it was costume jewelry, then small carvings and holy objects. Recently, there's been quite a trade here. Natives were taking the cheap carvings into the active zone, leaving there overnight, going back the next day for them. Unfortunately, some of the stuff, the jewelry in particular, had a tendency to dissolve and they uh, tried it with diamonds and the diamonds themselves would you know crystallize around them and then dissolve and then Raddick goes on and I says I can tell you in confidence of course this is not the only affected area in the world so now we see that it's happening in other places at this moment at least two other sites exist one in the Florida Everglades the other in the Pripyat marches of the Soviet Union. Naturally, both are under intensive investigation. And nobody quite knows exactly what's going on. Um, but they have some theories. They're talking about, you know, a satellite and then the Mount Hubble Observatory in the United States seeing distant galaxies efflorescing. Taitlin believes this is the Hubble effect, as they call it, closer to a cancer than anything else and about as curable, an actual proliferation of the subatomic identity of all matter. It's as if a sequence of displaced but identical images of the same object were being produced by refraction through a prism, but with the element of time replacing the role of light. So there we're starting to get the, the beginning of an explanation for what is happening within this world that will sooner or later become crystal. <clears throat> and we're, you know, going to get some interesting descriptions about what is happening uh, later on. So, for example, a helicopter crashes because the blades crystallize while it's near the trees, and they go on uh, looking, Raddick, Sanders, and, and his men um, going through the trees. They were soon within the body of the forest and had entered in an enchanted world. The crystal trees around them were hung with glass-like trellises of moss. The air was markedly cooler as if everything was sheathed in ice, but a ceaseless play of light poured through the canopy overhead. The process of crystallization was more advanced. The fences along the road were so heavily encrusted they formed a continuous palisade, a white frost at least six inches thick on either side of the palings. The few houses between the trees glistened like wedding cakes, their white roofs and chimneys transformed into exotic minarets and Baroque domes. On a lawn of green glass, spurs, a child's tricycle glittered like a Fabergé gem. The wheels starred into brilliant jasper crowns. So what is happening? Everything is getting 
covered, transformed into crystalline structures. Now, there's a further description about what is actually going on a bit later in this letter in the second part where um, Sanders is writing and he says, all this, my dear Paul, the very absence of surprise confirms my belief that this illumined forest in some way reflects an earlier period of our lives. And we're going to come back to that in a bit. It is perhaps our unique achievement as lords of this creation to have brought about the separation of time and space. We've given to each a separate value, a distinct measure of their own, which now define and bind us like the length and breadth of a coffin. To resolve them again is the greatest aim of natural science. As you and I have seen, Paul, in our work on the virus, with its semi-animate, crystalline existence, half in and half out of our own time stream, as if intersecting it at an angle. Often I think that in our microscopes, examining the tissue of those poor lepers in our hospital, we were looking upon a minuscule replica of the world I was to meet later in the forest slopes near Mount Royal. Then he goes on and he says, Paul, it seems obvious the real crisis is long past, tucked away on the back page of the same issue of Paris Soir as the short report on the sighting of another double galaxy by observers of the Hubble Institute on Mount Palomar. The news is summarized in less than a dozen lines and without comment, although the implication is inescapable that yet another focal area has been set up somewhere on the surface of the earth in the temple-filled jungles of Cambodia or the haunted amber forests of the Chilean highland. But it's still only a year since the Mount Palomar astronomers identified the first double galaxy in the constellation Andromeda, the great oblate diadem that is probably the most beautiful object in the physical universe, the island galaxy M31. He goes on and he says, we now know that it is time, which is responsible for the transformation. The recent discovery of antimatter in the universe inevitably involves the conception of anti-time as the fourth side of this negatively charged continuum where antiparticle and particle collide. They not only destroy their own physical identities, but their opposing time values eliminate each other, subtracting from the universe another quantum from its total store of time. It is random discharges of this type set off by the creation of anti-galaxies in space, which have led to the depletion of the time store available to the materials of our own solar system. Just as a supersaturated solution will discharge itself into a crystalline mass, so the supersaturation of matter in our continuum leads to its appearance in a parallel spatial matrix. As more and more time leaks away, the process of supersaturation continues. The original atoms and molecules, now here's the important part, producing spatial replicas of themselves, substance without mass, in an attempt to increase their foothold on existence. The process is theoretically without end, and it may be possible eventually for a single atom to produce an infinite number of duplicates of itself and so fill the entire universe, from which simultaneously all time is expired, an ultimate macrocosmic zero beyond the wildest dreams of Plato and Democritus. So, what's going on now? Well, I mean, we don't necessarily have to buy this explanation. This is Sanders speculating. Sanders is not himself a physicist. He's a uh, medical doctor. But it is quite an interesting speculation, isn't it? This goes way beyond just human beings screwing up the climate in some way or some random solar system event. This is the entire universe now, which is gradually becoming inhospitable to human life. We go on a little bit further, and um, I just want to read a few more passages. We talked about a, a downed helicopter. Um, at first, they passed the aircraft lying like an emblazoned fossil in a small hollow to the left of their path. Dr. Sanders failed to recognize it. Sanders remembered the helicopter plunging into the forest half a mile from the inspection site, 
The four twisted blades, veined and frosted like the wings of a giant dragonfly, had already been overgrown by the trellises of crystals hanging downward from the nearby trees. The fuselage had blossomed into an enormous translucent jewel in whose solid depths, like emblematic knights mounted in the base of a medieval ringstone, the two pilots sat frozen at their controls. Their silver helmets gave off an endless fountain of light. And they find Radic there, neither quite alive nor quite dead. Um, towards the end, we get uh, another interesting description. The crystallization of the forest was now almost complete. Only the jewels in the cross, jewels allow you to actually like keep the crystallization at bay, allowed Sanders to make his way through the vaults between the trees. Holding the shaft in his hands, he moved the cross piece along the trellises that hung everywhere like webs of ice, looking for the weaker panels that would dissolve in the light. When he reached for the river, he searched for the bridge he had found when he entered the forest for the second time, but the prismatic surface extended away in a wide bend, its light obliterating the few landmarks he might otherwise have recognized. So we get a world in which you can't even really get your bearings anymore. And we, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion with just another thing that he's writing in a letter. He says, um, I know now I shall one day return to the forest at Mount Royal. Each night the fractured disk of the Echo satellite passes overhead, illuminating the midnight sky like a silver chandelier. And I am convinced, Paul, that the sun itself has begun to efflorus. At sunset, when its disk is veiled by the crimson dust, it seems to be crossed by a distinctive latticework, a vast porticulus that will one day spread outward to the planets and the stars, halting them in their courses. A cosmic transformation, not only of the Earth, but of the solar system itself. And will there be any room for our human beings? Yes, but only as crystallized in this world that is hinted at yet to come. With an author like J.G. Ballard, who has so much to say, I think it's quite useful to look at some of the interviews that he's done over the years telling us about his writing and thinking and research processes, what it is that he's trying to do, and how he conceives of his own work. And I think that one of the interviews to begin with is uh, that which he did with Charles Char Murray. In it, he said, uh, now this is a kind of retrospective, even though The Drowned World was written over 20 years ago, it should be put in its context as the first inner space novel. Inner space was the flag which I nailed to my mast and The Drowned World, written in 62 or whenever it was, is literally the first inner space novel. Up to that point, catastrophe stories were being done on a very literal level as adventure stories, but the psychological adventure became the subject matter for me. He goes on, then he clarifies. If you look at the book marketing's council list, you'll see that John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids is there. Now, it's a fine novel, a classic example of the English kind of home countries, catastrophe fiction, a very polite society where all kinds of Private obsessions are kept firmly buttoned down and people struggle in the face of an external threat as they did during the Battle of Britain or as we're led to believe that they did during the Battle of Britain. My novel turns that all upside down. The hero embraces the catastrophe as a means by which he can express and fulfill his own nature, pursue his own mythology to the end, whatever that may be. He can accept the logic of his own personality and run that logic right down to the end of the road. That's a different approach. That's what the drowned world is about. That's what nearly 
all my fiction is about. Now, isn't that an interesting set of observations that he's making? So we've got, first of all, the attention to inner space. What is inner space? It's the psychology of the characters, not just in terms of their motivation, but in terms of their understanding of who they themselves are and how they relate to other human beings and to the environment that they're living in. Is a catastrophe indeed a catastrophe? It's not a Tolkienian you catastrophe. It's rather something different, offering divergent possibilities of figuring things out, changing valuations, changing what it is that you are up to. So that's a very interesting set of observations that he's giving there. And he's, he's tracing a kind of development, right? Going away from catastrophe as providing a kind of backdrop for a certain moralization and a kind of coming of age or adventure story as opposed to something richer, something deeper, something starker. Um, in an interview with George Macbeth, he's going to talk about science fiction. And Ballard says, I don't regard myself as a writer of what most people would call modern science fiction, which is predominantly American, even though much of it has been written by English writers. Modern American science fiction grew out of magazines such as the popular mechanics of the 30s. It's an extrovert, optimistic literature of technology. I think the new science fiction, which other, pe people, other, other people apart from myself are now beginning to write, is introverted, possibly pessimistic rather than optimistic, much less certain of its own territory. There's a tremendous confidence that radiates through all modern American science fiction of the period, 1930 to 1960, the certainty that science and technology can solve all problems. This is not the dominant form of science fiction now. I think that science fiction is becoming something much more speculative, much less convinced about the magic of science and the moral authority of science. There's far more caution on the part of the new writers than there was. So that's an interesting point. Then we have a, a longer excerpt from an interview that he carried out um, that I'm going to read only parts of with um, Yannick Storm. So again, Ballard begins by talking about science fiction, sort of tracing its history. He says, Modern American science fiction of the 1940s and 1950s is a popular literature of technology. It came out of American mass magazines and all that optimism about science and technology you found in those days. The science fiction written in those days came out of all this optimism that science was going to remake the world. Then came Hiroshima and Auschwitz and the image of science completely changed. People became very suspicious of science, but sci-fi didn't change. You still found this optimistic literature, the Heinlein, Asimov, Clark type of attitude towards the possibilities of science, which was completely false. Then he goes on and says, in the 1950s, during the testing of the hydrogen bomb, you could see that science was getting to be something much closer to magic. Also, science fiction was then identified with the idea of outer space. By and large, that was the image most people had of science fiction, the spaceship, the alien planet, and that didn't make much sense to me. It seemed like they were ignoring what I felt was the most important area, what I called, and I used the term for the first time seven years ago, inner space, which was the meeting ground between the inner world of the mind and the outer world of reality. Inner space you see in the paintings of the surrealists, Max Ernst, Dali, Tanguy, and Shiroko. Now notice, Inner space is not just going within. Ballard is saying something really important here. Inner space is the meeting ground between the inner world of the mind and the outer world of reality. <clears throat> so it by its very nature is not just the inner as opposed to the outer. It's the interface between the two of them. Now, he goes on and he says that these surrealists are painters of inner space. And I felt 
Science fiction should explore that area, the area where the mind impinges on the outside world and not just deal in fantasy. This was the trouble with sci-fi in the early 50s. It was becoming fantasy. It wasn't a serious, realistic fiction anymore. So I started writing. I'd written three novels and something like 70 short stories over the last 10 years. I think that perhaps in only one story there's a spaceship. It's just mentioned in passing. So he goes on and he's asked about landscapes. Are his landscapes symbolic? And he says, well, they're not real in the sense that I don't write naturalistically about the present day. Though in the latest group of stories, I've started to write the stories that I call condensed novels. I'm using the landscape of the present day. And he goes on a bit more and he's asked about, about science. And coming back to this, he says, you know, I'm not hostile to science itself. I think that scientific activity is about the only mature activity there is. What I'm hostile to is the image of science that people have. It becomes a magic wand in people's minds that will conjure up marvels, a kind of Aladdin's lantern. It oversimplifies things much too conveniently. Science now, in fact, is the largest producer of fiction. Isn't that an interesting paradox, a way of playing off of dichotomy? Science, all facts, you know, theories that we can prove, right, empirically. Fiction over here. And Ballard is saying, no, 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 no. Science used to be like that, but nowadays things have changed. And he's noting something that Nietzsche, for example, was already uh, attuned to back in the late 1800s, that in the work of science itself, it undermines its own credibility, values, and leaves things kind of hanging in a void, right? And it, in many respects, it's not that science doesn't work or technology doesn't work, but it is viewed in a magical, fantasiacal sense. So he goes on and he says that um, 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, science took its raw material from nature. A scientist worked out the boiling point of a gas or the distance of stars away from the earth. Whereas nowadays, particularly in the social psychological sciences, the raw material of science is a fiction invented by the sciences. You know, they work out why people chew gum or something of this kind. So the uh, sciences are spewing out an enormous amount of fiction. They're major producers of fiction. It's not the writers anymore. And we might say in our own time, and Ballard also realizes this, that, you know, business, the marketing industries, technology, they're all churning out stuff that is science-y, but isn't really old school science and is a kind of fiction that happens to be persuasive and catch on, or doesn't if people don't buy into it. Then he's asked about the new wave. And he says, well, I am the new wave of science fiction. I think it's only at the beginning, having knocked my own head against a brick wall for 10 years, you know, it's only now that people begin to accept I'm not a deliberate fool, which a lot of people thought I was when I first started writing. Um, and he goes on and talks about different kinds of science fiction and whether these people will stay in science fiction long enough to consolidate the new wave or whether, as I think will happen, they'll just move out of science fiction altogether and beginning write, begin writing a speculative fiction that doesn't know anything to science fiction. I don't know. And then he's asked, do you consider yourself a science fiction writer? And he says, not in the same sense that Isaac Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke are science fiction writers. Strictly speaking, I regard myself as a science fiction writer in the way that surrealism is also a scientific art. In a sense, Asimov, Heinlein, and the masters of American sci-fi are not really writing of science at all. They're writing about a set of imaginary ideas, which are conveniently labeled science. They're writing about the future. They're writing a kind of fantasy fiction about the future, closer to the Western and the thriller, but it really has nothing to do with science. I studied medicine, chemistry, physiology, physics, and I worked for about five years on a scientific journal. The idea that a magazine like Astounding or Analog, as it's now called, has anything to do with the sciences is ludicrous. It has nothing to do with the science. You have to only to pick up a journal like Nature or any scientific journal, and you can see that science belongs in a completely different world. Freud pointed out that you have to distinguish between analytic activity, which by and large is what the sciences are, and synthetic activities, which is what the arts are. The trouble with the Heinlein-Asimov type of science fiction is that it's completely synthetic 
And he says, Freud also said synthetic activities are a sign of immaturity. And that's where I think classical sci-fi falls down. And then uh, he's asked about the development of his own writing. And he says, it's been a process of evolution rather than revolution. And now here we get to the catastrophe novels. I wrote a novel called The Drought, which is my second novel after The Drowned World. It was a novel about desert areas. I noticed while I was writing it, I was beginning to explore the geometry of a very abstract kind of landscape and very abstract relationships between the characters. I went on from there to write a short story, which I call The Terminal Beach, which is set on uh, Anahuatoc, the island in the Pacific where the H-bomb was tested. There again, I was starting to look at the characters and events in a very abstract, almost cubist way. I was isolating aspects of character, isolating aspects of the narrative rather like a scientific investigator taking apart a strange machine to see how it works. Now, I think that applies to all three of the catastrophe novels myself, which is uh, quite, quite interesting. Um, a little bit uh, later on in that interview, he's going to talk about the um, what's going on in the 1960s. And he uh, then talks about the end of the Cold War. And he says that things are becoming more and more and more fiction, a media landscape, if you like. People's lives are getting more and more controlled by what I call fiction. And he says, by fiction, I mean anything invented for imaginative purposes. So for an example, you don't buy an airline ticket. You don't just buy transportation to the south of France or Spain. What you buy is the image of a particular airline, the kind of miniskirts the hostesses are wearing on that airline. In fact, airlines in America are selling themselves on that sort of thing. Also, the sort of homes people buy for themselves, the way they furnish their houses, even the way that they talk, the friends they have, everything is becoming fictionalized. Therefore, given that reality is now a fiction, it's not necessary for the writer to invent the fiction. The writer's relationship with reality is completely the other way around. It's the writer's job to find the reality, to invent the reality, not to invent the fiction. The fiction's already there. So this is quite interesting uh, as an observation. If we think about some of the implications of that for these particular uh, global catastrophe novels, what is Ballard actually doing in these, long before he starts doing you know, things like Crash and Atrocity Exhibition, if we buy into this formula that, we'll read it one more time, the uh, writer's job is to find the reality, to invent the reality, not to invent the fiction because the fiction is already there. We live in fictions of what the environment is, what the world is, how our global and local processes work, what our lives are. But those are all fiction and the reality is something that can be stripped away, that can be discovered as we change parameters, significant parameters. For instance, the oceans no longer uh, allowing water to be evaporated into the air and a great drought occurring, or the sun becoming hotter and the world becoming, you know, uh, more watery and uh, more more uh, hot and mankind having to navigate. Or uh, in the crystal world, something altogether different, crystals forming, whether we like them or not, in areas and encrusting things, taking them over uh, turning them, turning their very molecular composition, uh, not inside out, but in different ways. All of those are, we could say, realities within the novels that Ballard is writing for us and trying to get us away from the fictions that otherwise dominate our life. So he's doing a very interesting kind of speculative fiction here. Do we want to call it science fiction? That's, it depends on what we mean by that term. Ballard himself is comfortable enough with saying, yes, I write science fiction, just not that kind of science fiction. And it might turn into something else quite different down the line.
There is a pretty large secondary literature out there on J.G. Ballard and his works in general, and uh, even some that are particularly focused on these three novels of, sometimes they're called cli-fi or catastrophe novels, environmental novels. And so I wanted to bring you some of the most interesting insights that I've come across that I think we can chew on a bit. So the first one is from a piece by Bruce Franklin called What Are We to Make of J.G. Ballard's Apocalypse? And he tells us that J.G. Ballard and the other creators of an apocalyptic science fiction thrive because of certain conditions of the present era. And he says that, you know, from the outset, we must understand the enormous significance of science fiction in the most developed capitalist nations. So science fiction is a, a means for, for reaching a lot of people. And he says that um, Ballard is not some oddity or aberration, but a representative Anglo-American intellectual who's chosen to write science fiction because it's the most suitable vehicle for the expression of ideas he holds in common with many other Anglo-American individuals. And then he says something very interesting here. Ballard makes little pretense his fantasies of the death of the world or the human species are scientific, plausible, or even possible. The forms of his catastrophes are, in fact, mutually contradictory. There may be too many people or too few people. The world may get too dry, too wet. The environment may suddenly and inexplicably begin to move too fast or almost as suddenly and just as inexplicably begin to congeal. The end may come about through hydrogen bombs, solipsism, suicide, ceaseless urbanism, or a worldwide autogeddon of car crashes. Even within a single work, there's often no consistent explanation of why the cataclysm is occurring other than some vague pseudoscientific uh, theory presented like a magician's patter and perhaps offered to satisfy the conventional expectations of the readers of science fiction. And then he says, you know, um, the novels seem to me to, to fall neatly into two groupings, the early novels of worldwide physical catastrophe, that's what we're interested in, and then the later novels of psychological destruction. Of course, there's plenty of psychological ha havoc in the early novels, uh, but unifying all of these novels is the theme of the global catastrophe as an external projection of a deranged inner landscape. So I think that's the key thing in this essay. And then he goes on to talk about the, you know, the drowned world, for example. Uh, he says it presents the characteristic structural conception of Ballard's fiction, just as the drowned planet projects an inner landscape. So the body and psyche of the protagonist recapitulate in microcosm the world of nature. The sun is an almost conscious power, is burning off the ionosphere and reclaiming the planet for itself. The, the earth is becoming a steaming sea mingled with swamp and jungle. Artifacts of civilization are being inundated, inundated by water and taken over by reptiles. And the most sensitive human beings find their own minds booming to rhythms of the sun as they drift back into a primeval and pre-conscious world. This seems quite correct, right? And he goes on and he says, you know, my, my criticism of Ballard is he doesn't go far enough down below the unconscious to the sources of the alienation, self-destruction, and mass slaughter of our age. He therefore remains incapable of understanding the alternative to these death forces, the global movement towards human liberation, which constitutes the distinguishing characteristic of our epoch. The real nemesis of militarism, exploitation, and the rape of the environment is not the insane, overloaded man who's seeking to be free by obliterating the entire world, nor the suicidal quietist, um, like, you know, Karen's in the drowned world, Ransom in the drought, or Edward Sanders in the crystal world. So some interesting thoughts there. Good amuse-bouche. Uh, then we have uh, Joe Melissia's dry thoughts in a dry season where he talks about Ballard becoming famous because of the publication of four catastrophe novels, wind, flood, drought, and crystallization. Now, of course, we know that the wind one, uh, Ballard really doesn't even like that, that book, so that's part of why we're not looking at it. And then he goes on and he says, of the four... The Drought, The Burning World in its an original American version, is perhaps the most notable achievement 
Um, more plausible than the drowned world, less schematic than the crystal world. It's interesting for its constructing a world based on surrealist painting, a world that is also a symbolic reflection of the mental condition of the book's protagonist. Such qualities, now notice we're talking about genre here, may seem more to belong to fantasy than sci-fi, but it's also interesting for its relations to one of the classic categories of sci-fi, the apocalypse story. No doubt, all sci-fi may be called apocalyptic if one's definition is broad enough to include any radical changes from present conditions. And then he goes on and he says, you know, we can actually distinguish various ca uh, categories of the disaster novel. And then think about how Ballard stuff fits into this. So here's the distinctions he is proposing. Disasters unchecked versus disasters averted, right? Um, so a classic model, H.G. Wells, the war, the war of the Worlds, right? The disaster is averted. Michael Crichton's the Andromeda strain. Well, Ballard's are not averted. Um, disasters unchecked. Disasters in the process of happening versus those ha having happened long ago. And he goes on and he says, you know, post-disaster novels can be subdivided according to the theme, Fall of Man, By the Waters of Babylon, Survival of the Fittest, Degeneration of the Species. And he says, if we think about what's going on in Ballard, so the, the, the drought begins with the disaster underway. The second part of the novel portraying primitive social institutions in which survivors organize on the Great Salt Dunes is part of the same tradition of disaster long past fiction like Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz. Success, this is a third, versus failure in coping with disaster, right? So, you know, we have paradigms like Robinson Crusoe and uh, Lord of the Flies as being two. The first celebrates man's ability to survive or prevail in extreme conditions, like in the wind from nowhere, while the second portrays mob rule or sinking to bestial levels, as in the drought, um, or, you know, others. And perhaps we should include a third possibility, the impassive chronicle of biological spectacle, like Stapledon's first and last and first men. Fourth, various types of disaster, right? There's all different sorts that we can divide it into. Now notice, he says, in all of Ballard's novels, except the drought, the catastrophe is outside of human control, as it is in many tales of plagues, alien invasions, and meteorological or geological disturbances. Um, and then we can divide natural disasters further if we want to. But the drought is really about our own screwing up the environment and then paying the costs. And then finally, the fifth one, causes of disaster that are of central interest to the writer versus those merely providing a situation the writer wants to develop. Most novels of man-made disaster are actively interested in the cause, right? Because we're warning, like he says, against war, ecological decay, or they may more sophisticatedly explore the dark side of human nature. Um, some causes might be of interest in terms of scientific speculation. Uh, exactly what effects could sunspots have on the Van Allen belt in which the reason for world crystallization is of organic importance to every aspect of the novel. So interesting breakdown here, and we can see where do, do Ballard's stories fit into this, this schema. Uh, we got a good uh, little thing from Jason Heller's review of The Crystal World, the third of these uh, apocalyptic novels that Ballard actually uh, likes. And it says, J.G. Ballard is often considered the godfather of cli-fi, climate fiction. The legendary British author's cataclysmic novels of the 1960s, including The Burning World, The Drowned World, The Wind from Nowhere, imagine the nightmarish results of a trio of climate-related disasters, but they're all pulpy in nature compared with 1966, The Crystal World. In his first truly mature work, Ballard draws from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness in his effort to symbolize climate change as something far more insidious, a transmutation of the atomic structure of nature itself, one that's gradually rendering all flora and fauna as crystal. It's a startling yet subtle work that cuts to the heart of the stark reality of climate change 
that we might be soon be living in a world that's fundamentally alien to us. In a sense, now I really love this. The crystal world is a body horror novel, except that instead of the body horror happening to a person, it's happening to the earth. I think this is a very insightful set of remarks here. Uh, another really interesting analysis is provided by Ardini in Resurrected from Its Own Sewers, Waste, Landscape, and the Environment in J.G. Ballard's Climate Novel. And the idea here is that uh, waste, trash, repurposing is at the center of what's going on as a theme in J.G. Ballard's works. And so he talks about uh, the crystal world providing a fitting end to the climate novels insofar as it takes the question of what one does with waste to its most extreme conclusion, where a drowned world envisions a world of nature machine hybrids composed of manufactured effluvia overgrown by plants, and the drought explores ways of transforming waste into objects, dart, or dwellings, this last text imagines the transformation of objects into artifacts of themselves and humans into something that is, in one of the characters' words, neither animate nor inanimate, neither alive nor dead. In this way, the crystal world renders the tension between past and future, humankind and nature, wastage and making new, and self and landscape still more explicit. Right? And going on... Uh, it says, it is, this, this, uh, uh, what's this crystallization, a disaster far more open to interpretation than the flood and the drought of the previous two texts. For the multiple jewel-like artifacts or sculptures into which, into which each object is transformed are uh, at the novel's outset prized as lucrative commodities by local market stall owners, and to be integrated into the local economy. Put differently, the text appears to elliptically explore a more extreme version of the catastrophe outline in the, dr the drought. For the crystallized, multiplying structures in the crystal world are but a more intrusive, visible, and ubiquitous version of the plastic polymers coating the sea in its predecessor. So this is a very interesting thing. And then finally... Um, Moritz in Ingervescence, uh, Environmental Catastrophe as Morphogenesis in Human Transformations in Ballard's Climate Novels has a couple interesting things to say. So this has to do with entropy. As several scholars have noted, the overriding scientific framework governing Ballard's early novels is the second law of thermodynamics. First formulated by Rudolf Clausius in 1850, it axiomatizes that every thermodynamically closed system will succumb to the eventual disintegration of order and structure. As available energy is dissipated, the system's entropy reaches a maximum, a condition that corresponds to a uniform statistical distribution of particles and velocities. Antithetically to the Victorian fetishization of industrial and social progress, it seemed to sketch an evolutionary path that ineluctably ends in demise, the notorious heat death of the universe, not a fiery apocalypse, but the eventual transformation of all kinetic and potential energy into random quivering of elementary particles, so-called thermal noise. Now, he goes on and, and writes, via its introduction of irreversible action, the second law of thermodynamics provided an implicit definition of a linear and unidirectional flow of time. The universe was not only a mechanistic clockwork, but a clockwork running down. So what we've got here, right? Victorian progress, things are getting better and better. Ooh, crap, the universe is breaking down and there's nothing we can do about it. Here's where we get a third possibility. This is very interesting. So the author goes on to say, um, Ballard's literalizations of the second law of thermodynamics and its shorthand reduction to the specter of increasing entropy decisively depart from Victorian and modernist imaginaries. Admits dissipative dissipative environmental conditions, his protagonists are ambiguously caught in a process not only of dissolution, entropy, but of transformation. The material forces of his environments and disequilibrium precipitate both ruination, entropy, 
and rebirth. Uh, Lawrence Pershing is right to call Ballard's apocalypse ambiguous, but I am less inclined to agree that this vexation is merely a response to the ambiguous nature of modern life. I would like to advance that his fiction metabolizes the ambiguous nature of material morphological, changing in form, processes, a concern that can be traced along a shift in 20th century science to the study of open systems, the self-organizing capacities of inorganic matter, and the fuzzy dividing lines between life and non-life, right? So this is saying that Ballard, drawing on the Surrealists, is actually putting forth a vision in which we have an estranged environment no longer framed as the externalization of a rationalistic human gaze or a world for us. And he says, just as, in the, just as the ego in the age of psychoanalysis is no longer the master of its own house, Earth becomes an alien planet. So what we have here in these novels is the transformation of human beings. To bring it all back together, the element of inner space that's central to Ballard's uh, conception of where science fiction ought to be, the changing world, which offers not just a breakdown, but the possibility for transformation. But transformation, meaning you can't go back to the order that there was previously. And this is what we do see in each of some, each of the novels with certain of the characters. So I think this might provide us with some useful lenses for understanding what is actually going on, not just in Ballard's works as a whole or his thought as a whole, but particularly in these three great cli-fi environmental collapse catastrophe novels. In addition to the transformations of the environment and its things, its flora and fauna, we can say that there's a lot of changes in human beings and their social structures, their relationships, their understandings of themselves happening in these works. And we can't really say just in addition because these are intimately connected. What we have in the case of the drowned world is a cataclysm that has been going on now for really generations. But interestingly, there's still a lot of structure, not so much among the characters themselves, but further north, further south, right? And we see a breakdown happening in the drought or the burning world. And then we have even the, the most um, massive adjustment occurring in the crystal world, but only towards the end and only hinted at. So what do we mean by this? Well, you know, each of these novels does have characters of the normal sense and there's conflicts between them, there's cooperation between them, there's dialogues and interchanges and telling people what matters to them. And each of them is marked by, let's call them several crazy characters, Strangmen in the drowned world, um, Venter in, in the, uh, the crystal world, um, we could come up with a couple Lomax Quilty, um, the, the preacher in the drought, and some of them can be quite dangerous. They work at cross purposes, you know, the main character, uh, or let's say not the main character, but the central character, um, in, uh, the, the drowned world almost dies, Karen's, because of what it is that, um, is imposed upon him by this wild, crazy guy, Strangman. So there's all of that going on. We also do have uh, male-female relationships, you know, some of which are in the past, some of which are seemingly, you know, they're not completely non-sexual, but the characters aren't actually having sex a lot of the time. And so, you know, there, there's all of these things that make up human life going on. 
But with each of the characters, the main characters, because each one is centered around a uh, key character who's middle-aged, uh, well-educated, kind of detached from the rest of the activities and structures that are, that are going on, not committing themselves entirely until they do commit themselves. Um, each of them is a, let's say, not just a representation, but an exploration of what Ballard has called inner space. And let's remember too, as we just reminded ourselves, inner space, according to Ballard, is not a pure interiority or like a interior monologue or the insanity of somebody cut off from the rest of the world. Inner space refers to how their own psychological condition relates to the external world, which is in process of changing. And in some respects, the characters are undergoing similar things to what the other characters are, but there's also the possibility of transformation that embraces what is happening. And the other really key element, so we've talked about space, but time also plays a central role in each of these. So let, let's look at the drowned world first. We find out uh, quite early on that Karen's um, is kind of a different person. We read, it was perhaps this absence of personal memories that made Karen's indifferent to the spectacle of these sinking civilizations. He'd been born and brought up entirely within what had once been known as the Arctic Circle, now a subtropical zone with an annual mean temperature of 85 degrees, and had come southward only on joining one of the ecological surveys in his early 30s. The vast swamps and jungles had been a fabulous laboratory, the submerged cities little more than elaborate pedestals. So he doesn't have that much of a stake in the ruin of the Europe that, that he is inhabiting along with these other characters. Now we get something really interesting uh, brought up fairly early on. And um, Bodkin and Karens are talking and Bodkin says, um, I'm not suggesting that Homo sapiens is gonna tra transform himself into you know, a lower form of human being. But after two or 300 million years, Homo sapiens might well die out and our little cousin, the marmot here, might become the highest form of life on the planet. However, a biological process isn't completely reversible. Um, and so he goes on and he says, I'm really thinking of something else. Is it only the external landscape which is altering? How often recently most of us have had the feeling of deja vu of having seen this all before, in fact, of remembering these swamps and lagoons all too well. However selective the conscious mind may be, most biological memories are unpleasant ones, echoes of danger and terror. Nothing endures for so long as fear. Everywhere in nature, one sees evidence of innate releasing mechanisms, literally millions of years old, which have lain dormant through thousands of generations, but have retained their power undiminished. The field rat's inherited image of the hawk silhouette is a classic example. How else can you explain the universal but completely groundless loathing of the spider? only one species of which has ever been known to sting, or equally surprising in view of their comparative rarity, ha hatred of snakes and reptiles, simply because we all carry within ourselves a submerged memory of the time when the giant spiders were lethal and when the reptiles were the planet's dominant life form. And so he said, so Karen says, your fright in the increased temperature and radiation are alerting similar IRMs in our own minds. And the doctor goes on, not in our minds, Robert. These are the oldest memories on earth. The time codes carried in every chromosome and gene, every step we've taken in our evolution is a milestone inscribed with organic memories from the enzymes controlling the carbon dioxide cycle to the organization of the brachial plexus and the nerve pathways of pyramidal, pyramidal cells in the midbrain. Each is a record of a thousand decisions taken in the face of a sudden physical chemical crisis. 
Just as psychoanalysis reconstructs the original traumatic situation in order to release the repressed material, we are now being plunged back into the archaeophysic past, undercovering the ancient taboos and drives that have been dormant for epochs. The brief span of an individual life is misleading. Every one of us is as old as the entire biological kingdom and our bloodstreams are tributaries of the great sea of its total memory. The uterine odyssey of the growing fetus recapitulates the entire evolutionary past, and its central nervous system is a coded time scale, each nexus of neurons and each spinal level marking a symbolic station, a unit of neuronic time. The further down the, the central nervous system you move, you descend back into the neuronic past. So he calls this the psychology of total equivalence or neuronics for short. And he says, as we move back through geogra geophysical time, we re-enter the amniotic corridor and move back through spinal and archaeopsychic time, recollecting in our unconscious minds the landscapes of each epoch, each with a distinctive geological terrain, its own unique flora and fauna, as recognizable to anyone else as they would be to a traveler in a Wellsian time machine. So we've got this interesting theory going on being articulated by this, this doctor at this point, that as the earth is being reverted back to earlier eras, we ourselves are inevitably going so. Now he adds one other thing. This is no scenic railway, but a total reorientation of the personality. If we let these buried phantoms master us as they reappear, we'll be swept back helplessly in the flood tide like pieces of flotsam, right? So that's an interesting prospect that maybe they could resist, right? Uh, resistance could mean moving north to where it's cooler, at least for a time. Then, uh, a bit later on, we find out about um, something that they've been undergoing. So, Beatrice Dahl, Dahl has been having these bad dreams, right? And Karens knew that for some reason he'd been reluctant to give Beatrice any real sympathy, cutting his questions about the nightmares as short as possible, never offering her treatment or sedative, nor had he tried to follow up any of Bodkin's or Riggs' oblique remarks about the dreams and their danger, almost as if he had known he would soon be sharing them and accepted them as an inevitable element of his life, like the image of his own death each carried with him in the secret places of his heart. So Bodkin says to him, so you're one of the dreamers now, Robert. You beheld the Fata Morgana of the Terminal Lagoon. You look tired, right? And so these, these dreams um, are being experienced by many of the people there. And Bodkin says, you've held out for a long time. It's quite a tribute to the strength of your pre-conscious filters. We were all wondering when you'd arrive. Figuratively, of course, I've never discussed the dreams with anyone except for Hardman and their poor chap. The dreams were having him. Hardman is going to actually take off into the jungle and we'll find him at the very end. So they're not only like, you know, beginning to revert in certain ways, their dream life is doing that as well. And we find out that um, it's affecting people's decision making too. So there is uh, a seeming accident that might actually be an attempt at suicide. And Strangman says something very interesting. Um, don't perpetuate a myth. Karens will be much more grateful for the truth. He anchored that cable himself quite deliberately. Why? Because he wanted to become part of the drowned world. And the joke is he doesn't know whether I'm telling the truth or not. Do you realize that, Bodkin? Look at him. He genuinely isn't sure. And then uh, Beatrice says, stop saying that it might have been an accident. And Strangman says, it might. Let's admit that. Did I or did I not try 
to kill myself. One of the few existential absolutes far more significant than to be or not to be, which merely underlines the uncertainty of suicide rather than the eternal ambivalence of his victim. And he says, Karen's, I envy the, the, you the task of finding out if you can. So Karen's is starting to crack up, to slide away into what we might consider madness, but it might also just be considered a transformation of the inner space. And we, we come to the end where Karen has uh, gone off into the jungle and he finds uh, in the very last chapter, Hardman, whose eyes have long since burnt, been burnt out, uh, who's quite sick and he nurses him back to health. And Hardman uh, takes off into the jungle and then he decides he's going to go south. Karen's is going deeper into the jungle. And he says, uh, he knew that Hardman would soon die and his own life might not long survive the mass of unbroken jungles to the south. So he writes, 27th day, have rested and am moving south. All is well. And so that's an interesting thing. He's not mourning. He's not despairing. He is off entering into a new landscape and a new era with a different personality. What happens in the next novel, The Drought? Again, we find the same sorts of strange transformations of personality taking place. And I'm just going to bring up a few with uh, ransom that are happening very early on in the, in the very first chapter. At the end of it, we read, throughout the long summer, Ransom had watched the river shrinking, its countless associations fading as it narrowed into a shallow creek. Above all, Ransom was aware of the role of the river in time, that the role of the river in time had changed. Once it had played the part of an immense fluid clock, the objects immersed in it taking up their positions, like the stations of the sun and planets. The continued lateral movements of the river, its rise and fall, and the varying pressures on the hull were like the activity within a vast system of evolution, whose cumul cumulative forward flow is an irrelevant and without meaning as the apparently linear motion of time itself, the real movements were those random and discontinuous relationships between the objects within it, those of himself and Mrs. Quilter, her son, and the dead birds and fish. With the death of the river, so would vanish any contact between those stranded on the drained floor. For the present, the need to find some other measure of their relationships would be concealed by the problems of their own physical survival. survival. Nonetheless, Ransom was certain that the absence of this great moderator, the river, which cast its bridges between all animate and inanimate objects, would prove of crucial importance. Each of them would soon literally be an island in an archipelago drained of time. Now, isn't that an interesting idea? Time isn't stopping course it goes on but the meaning of time is changing as the landscape is becoming desiccated and the flow of water is ending um, a little bit later on we read that um, ransom is talking to to whitman about these different people that are that are you know prowling around and he said um he realized, he's talking about um, Lomax and Miranda. Uh, he realized the role of the recluse and solitary meditating on his past sins of a mission like a hermit on the fringes of an abandoned city would not be viable. The blighted landscape and its end, empty violence, its loss of time would provide its own motives. These latent elements in Lomax and Miranda, two people that he knows that are rich and crazy, were already appearing. Um, and he goes on and he says, perhaps this phantom, the phantom of a Miranda, embodied archaic memories of a time, whether past or future, when fear and pain were the most valuable emotions and their exploitation into the most perverse forms, the sole imperative. 
Now, we're getting something that kind of harkens back to what um, was being referenced in the drowned world, except here, notice this, their exploitation into the most perverse forms of fear and pain. And that is what does, in fact, happen by the end of the book with Lomax, with Miranda, with Quilter, with all these characters. And he goes on, and he, he, this is the narration. It was this sense of remorseless caprice with its world of infinite possibilities unrestrained by any moral considerations, which had its expression in the figure of the white-haired witch. So that's quite an interesting thing to note. And then much later on in it, we find that um, this is five years, well, 10 years later, actually, but for five years, Ransom has been um, living with Judith. And um, she's not making a lot of contributions, but he's, he, uh, it, we read, it was not this, the fact that she would guard their water and fish stocks that held them together, but their awareness that only with each other could they keep alive some faint shadow of their former personalities, whatever their defects and arrest the gradual numbing of sense and identity that was an unseen gradient of the dune limbo. Like all purgatories, the beach was a waiting ground, the endless stretches of wet salt sucking away from them all, but the hardest core of themselves. These tiny nodes of identity glimmered in the light of the limbo, the zone of nothingness that waited for them to dissolve and de deliquous like the crystals dried by the sun. So... Isn't that an interesting set of observations about the toll that this is taking on all these different people? Then with the crystal world, we really don't get to see the effects on persons and their psyches apart from their bodies until about halfway through the book. And... Um, there's a very interesting set of reflections about time uh, and about the forest where the crystallization is taking place. So uh, Sanders uh, says, you've been here before? And Ventress says, do you mean deja vu? And Sanders says, I mean literally. And Ventress then says, we've all been here before, doctors. Everyone will soon find out if there's time. He pronounced the world with a per peculiar inflection of his own drawing it out <clears throat> like the tolling of a bell. He listened to the last echoes reverberate away among the crystal walls like a fading requiem. However, I feel that's something we're all running out of, Doctor. Do you agree? So this is going to be a key theme of the, the catastrophe that the crystallization is. It's affecting time itself. So... The, the doctor says, running out of time, I haven't thought about it yet. What's your explanation? Isn't it obvious, doctor? Doesn't your own specialty, the dark side of the sun we see around us here, provide a clue? Surely leprosy like cancer is above all a disease of time, a result of overextending oneself through that particular medium. And then Sanders says, well, it's a theory. And then uh, Ventress says, look at the viruses, doctor with their crystalline structure, neither animate nor inanimate, and their immunity to time. You and I will be like them soon, Sanders, and the rest of the world, neither living nor dead. Now, isn't that kind of a, a frightening prospect to contemplate? Um, a little bit later on in here, we find out that Sanders made a, a, what he calls an appalling blunder. He finds this man, Roddick, uh, cr completely crystallized, and uh, he tries to immerse him in the river, and he had to tear him loose. Some of the crystals came off. The crystals were the man. And so um, parts of him are gone. But now here's the most interesting part. He says... Max, I don't understand me. It wasn't just that. The point is he wanted to go back. He wanted to go back to the forest and be crystallized again. He knew, Max. He knew. So Raddick 
a doctor himself had wanted to go back into the crystalline state that he'd been transformed into. And this is what's going to happen to quite a few people. Later on, we find that the area in the forest is spreading about 100 feet a day. And half a, uh, this is happening in uh, other places, including Florida. Half the state has been evacuated. And uh, Suzanne says, can you imagine that, Edward, an entire city, all those hundreds of white hotels transformed into stained glass? And uh, Max says, you make it sound like the New Jerusalem. Before you could turn around, I'm afraid you'd find yourself an angel in a rose window. And so they're able to understand what is happening to the world and the people within it. Um, now, there's a character, a priest, Baltus, who plays a, a somewhat significant role in this, and he says some quite interesting things as well. So Baltus says, um, it, may be, it may sound heretical to say so, but the body of Christ is with us everywhere here in every prism and rainbow in the 10,000 faces of the sun, so you see, I fear that the church, like its symbol, may have outlived its function. And Baltus says, once I was a true apostate. I knew God existed, but I could not believe in him. Now events have overtaken me. For a priest, there is no greater crisis to deny God when he can be seen to exist in every leaf and flower. And at the very end of Baltus's discourse, he'll say, um, in this forest where all of the crystallization is taking place, we see the final celebration of the Eucharist, the transformation, right, of Christ's body. Here, everything is transfigured and illuminated, joined together, now notice these words, in the last marriage of space and time. Not only is the landscape being transformed, but time is also being transformed. And the last uh, passage that I want to um, bring up here is towards the, the uh, end of the book. And, um, you know, they're saying eh, there's not much point to doctors uh, right now. Um, you know, we're not going to actually cure people of, of all of this sort of stuff. And what we find out is that um, Max, who's married to Suzanne, doesn't quite understand uh, the significance of the forest for Suzanne and Sanders. Uh, what is the significance? Here we get back to the inner space theme. That for both of them, the only final resolution of the imbalance within their minds, their inclination toward the dark side of the equinox, could be found in that crystal world. So in each of these, we actually have mentions of the, the title, right? And the mention of the drowned world, the crystal world. These are places that human beings, despite the, the strange transformations that are required, can participate in, can evolve or devolve or transform to be members of, and in some respect, understand themselves differently and approach the world differently. So on that philosophical theme, uh, so interestingly laid out in these three novels, we end our discussion of these environmental catastrophe novels of Ballard, and we bring this to a close.